Welcome to the Olympia Library. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Zach. I work here at the Olympia Library as well as the West Olympia Library. My colleague Betsy is in the back there. We're going to be around. If you need help with anything, just let us know. I have a few quick announcements and then I'll hand things over to the professionals. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters of Thurston County and to Thurston Community Media and the candidates for helping us put this on. We're very excited to offer this opportunity to you. Um, bathrooms down that hallway if you need them. Um, cell phones, please, quiet or off. And if you need to leave or exit, um, exit the way that you came in, please. Um, check out our website for events. We've got some flyers on the way out if you want to pick them up. Lots of cool stuff going on, but I don't want to bother you with library stuff. Let me go ahead and introduce Deb Vinsel from Thurston Community Media, and then we'll get the ball rolling. Thank you, everybody. are one of the things I love doing best about my job with Thurston Community Media, being able to educate our community about important issues uh, that face us. We want to thank the League for their more than 30 years of partnership doing candidate forums uh, with us. Uh, it has been a privilege and a blessing to have their partnership with what we do. You can find out more about Thurston Community Media. Go to our website, tcmedia.org. We offer a variety of training classes and media production. We have a facility and equipment available for community use, and we would love to see you in the studio. Thanks for being here tonight. Oh, and this, I'm sorry, I need to do my job. This is Darlene Hines, president of the League. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's nice to see everyone here. Um, the League of Women Voters is proud to be able to do these forums and continue to educate our voters. The League of Women Voters is proud to be nonpartisan, neither supporting or opposing candidates or views at any level of government. We are happy to be here tonight to make sure that um, the information is given out and that we always work to make sure everybody has the information they need to be, um, to be uh, good voters. Uh, one of the things we want to make sure is that everybody has the information and is able and um, can vote. It is our biggest thing. So we are here to defend our democracy and encourage people to vote. Um, a couple things. Uh, some of the candidates have some information over on the card table over there on your way out. The league also has some information in the back uh, that uh, is about us and what we do. and. We'd be happy to talk to you afterwards about what we do and, and how you can join us. Um, this should be a wonderful forum. And our moderator tonight has been a longtime League member and was president of the League of Women Voters. And um, that is Sandra Herndon. And she is going to go ahead and moderate this um, event. Thank you, Sandra. <coughs> while I get hooked up. Okay, welcome. Delighted to have all you folks here in the library. It's a pleasure to see this many people. And for those of you who will be viewing online, we want to thank you for tuning in to this 2023 General Election Candidate Forum for the Olympia School District Board of Directors, Districts 1, 2, and 4. This forum is presented, as, we, as has been mentioned, by the League of Women Voters of Thurston County in collaboration with Thurston Community Media, longtime collaboration, and the Olympia Timberland Library. So we're delighted. Um, I will be moderating this forum, and James Allen over here behind the post will be timing you. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. Very important. One. A word about the office that these people are running for. The Olympia School Board oversees the Olympia School District, which covers the city of Olympia and surrounding areas to the west and east. The district serves almost 10,000 students on 19 campuses. The Olympia School District Board of Directors is comprised of five elected members. The board sets district goals and policies, 
it adopts the budget, it places tax levies and bond issues on the ballot, it hires personnel, including the superintendent, and provides the necessary facilities for the education of our community's youth. Further, the school board appoints student representatives to serve on the board in an advisory capacity at board meetings, and they may cast non-binding advisory votes on motions before the board. About this forum, it includes candidates for Olympia School Board Districts 1, 2, and 4. The candidates for District 1 are Maria Flores and Talana Reed. You can raise your hand when I call your name. <laughs> candidates for District 2 are Frank DeRocher and Jess Tortolat Palumbo. Candidates for District 4 are Hillary Seidel and Leslie Van Lessout. Unfortunately, Leslie is unable to attend this evening. Each candidate will have the opportunity to answer a series of questions supplied by the public. We will call on candidates by district in alphabetical order. The questions will be alternated so that each one has a chance to start first. Each candidate will have one minute to respond. If you need me to repeat the question, don't hesitate to ask. The timer will turn yellow when you have 15 seconds left and then we'll show a stop sign when your time is up. If you don't notice the stop sign, I will tell you when your time is up. Candidates may also, will also have a one minute closing statement. An important note, we stress the importance of civility in these forums. Candidates, you have received the ground rules for the forum and have agreed to abide by them. We ask you in the audience to abide by the following rules as well. Please silence your cell phones and do not record the forum. In case your cell phone goes off, we will assume that is your signal that you want to contribute to the library. It will come right <laughs> <off> <laughs> <with asking. laughs> Thurston Community Media is recording the forum and it will be posted on our websites in the coming weeks. Please do not make comments to the candidates or to me, at least until after the program, and hold your applause until the end of the program. You've been, you've been given the opportunity to ask questions. If you have not done so already and put them in the basket, we have volunteers going around with three by five cards. Um, and the volunteers will coordinate these questions so that they meet the criteria and are not duplicates. The criteria are posted all around. In short, directed to all the candidates, relevant to the job, short, no multi-part, no speeches, and neutral, not biased in favor of one or the other. Okay, so now we will get started. First question, We'll begin on that end, and each time we'll begin with the next person. The first question I'll begin with Maria Flores. What makes you the most qualified candidate for this position? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I'm Maria Flores. I am serving currently in the, the director district one position. What makes me most qualified are the lenses I bring to the work. So I'm a former teacher. I taught on the Navajo Nation, uh, fourth and second grade and eighth grade chemistry, algebra, and physics. And I specifically chose to teach on the Navajo Nation because I am native myself and I was there to close my students' opportunity gaps. I am a parent. My daughter just graduated from Avanti and I am very invested in this district and have um, worked with her throughout her career as a student who is disabled, who is multiracial and transgender to be able to navigate her experiences in public education. And lastly, I'm a policy leader at the state level. I work at OSPI and the executive director for the Center for the Improvement of Student Learning. But the thing I would add is that I am a student whose life was saved by public education. I grew up in extreme poverty and I have invested and devoted my life to public education in order to be able to have um, students have the same experience that I did. Oh. I'm Talana Reed, and I currently serve as Director of District 2, running for District 1. 
Uh, what makes me most qualified? I am the mother of twins who graduated in 2021. They're in their third year of college right now. I currently work in the community as a direct service provider, advocating for tenants, unhoused individuals, and my, with my community service, lived experience, and my professional experience in advocacy, I feel like it serves the board well. I have proven that I will prioritize transparency, accountability, and truly advocating for the, the needs of all students. Um, I have committed to, work, to making evidence-based decisions um, and just really, really um, support the, the success of all of our students and everything that I do. My name is Frank DeRocher and I'm running for District 2. Uh, I think the thing that makes me the most qualified for this position is my extensive community involvement uh, over the years. When my wife and I first moved here in 2014 with our family, we, um, we dove in in so many different ways. I have been uh, PTO heavily involved in the PTO uh, in my kids' schools, I, including serving a couple years as PTO president. I have been a soccer coach, which turned into team manager when the kids got better than I was. And I've been a licensed foster parent, a youth mentor. Um, I have been speaking up uh, on issues here publicly for a while, long before I decided to run for school board. Um, and I'm a project manager by trade, which requires the ability to be the glue to hold conversations together um, when there are varying interests in the room as you work towards something that works for everybody represented. All right. Yes. Um, I'm a strong candidate and would make a contribution to the school board for District 2. I'm a academic specialist for the Evergreen State College for a trio student success program specific towards students with disabilities, which works with limited income first generation to earn the BA and with those with documented disabilities. Um, every day I see the needs of our students who come out of a K through 12 system. So I see the gaps that have occurred for them. And I also see the strengths that they came from that K through 12 system. Um, I've also worked as an independent living specialist doing programmatic um, pieces for youth uh, with disabilities, everything from emergency preparedness to social development, as well as being able to re receive the right to vote and being able to know what that means. Um, I also have a, stu a little one who's in the Hanson Elementary in an IEP, as well as being a student of myself in special education, mainstreaming, and being in, in special ed and having to navigate those systems. Hi, I'm Hillary Seidel. Um, I am a parent of three children in our school system, so I understand the impacts directly. Um, I have 25 plus years of experience volunteering and working in youth and family services and education, and I've been serving as the school board representative for District 4 since 2017. I also served as the school board president um, at the height of the pandemic. So I'm a tested leader who's been through crisis before and has helped our community navigate that difficult time. And I'm asking for um, another chance to keep doing that work. I think what I bring to the work, I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person, but what I bring to the work is a commitment to engagement and innovation and equity. And I think the community has seen that I follow through on my promises by increasing um, opportunities for community engagement, by increasing investment and equity supports and innovative programs and seats in advanced learning. And I hope to return and keep doing the work that we've been doing and being successful doing in Olympia. Thank you. The next question I'll, I'll combine, because there are two questions here, but they're very similar. We'll start with Talana. Um, some states, as you know, have banned schools from covering topics such as racism and sexual orientation. We'd like to know what are your views on such prohibitions? Are you in favor of banning books in our schools? If so, why? And if not, why not? Well, I believe that any uh, materials that we provide for students should be based upon our, the, our state learning standards and, and the needs of our students. I, do, I don't believe in banning books as long as they're in alignment with our uh, state standards and, and adhere to those standards. As board members, we are responsible for ensuring that we have policies that are in alignment with the state law and ensuring that, again, all students get equitable access to resources and 
you know, while some topics may be controversial to, to others, we're not in a position to, to, to police that necessarily with other families. We have a standard of learning for all students, and we just need to adhere to that um, in the interest of, of ensuring that our students are safe with the materials. As a board, we need to monitor those uh, monitor those things and make sure that we are responding to the public with their concerns um, regarding the information their students are, are taking in. I agree with a lot of what Talana said that um, I think I inherently think that there is value to almost anything that somebody has taken the exhausting effort to put pen to paper on and published um, and made available. Um, I think that, so I'm certainly not a book burner or a book banner. Um, I think that the question becomes uh, a, a matter of audience and appropriateness. I think, um, just like Talana said, we as uh, board members have, need proposed board member, uh, we have the requirement and um, the job to make sure that the audiences are, 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 are diverse enough to, and that the materials are diverse enough to be able to uh, accommodate what is being taught in the schools in alignment with the values and the education goals that we have for our students. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, for, it's not the job of the school board to ban books. I want to be very clear about that. That is not the role of the school board. Um, and also, as a school board member, um, potentially, <laughs> um, is that I've got to trust the librarians, the administrator who's made the decisions that the books that are in, within the libraries that the students have access to, or also in the classroom, are around the age appropriate and development of the students and that meets that. Also, books that speak to LGBTQIA plus audiences and BIPOC students and students with disabilities, those speak their lived experiences or those experiences that they're developing and they get that through the stories and the power of books. That's the beautiful thing about books and I don't think as long as they're meeting those requirements, that would be within the jobs of the school board. Thank you. Thank you. Hillary. Yeah, I mean, this is a really important question. And um, I want to start by saying thank you to Jess for recognizing the great work of our librarians. We have an amazing set of school librarians, and they do a lot of really great work on the procedures um, that are aligned to our policies, which are fantastic. I encourage you to read our school district policies. Um, we have a pretty locked in policy on instructional materials approval, which is how we approve um, materials for use in classrooms, and also in materials approval for our libraries. And our school librarians have been working on revising the procedures to align with new state laws and changes and they're always working on that. Um, they're an incredible um, resource for our schools. I think the other thing I would say is that although we may be uncomfortable with certain ideas, we're not allowed to restrict those ideas from other people's children, right? And so as parents, we also have an opportunity to say, let's open that backpack and see what you got in the library today. And if it's something that I'm a little uncomfortable about, then maybe that's for me to have that conversation with my kids. But it's not for your school board directors to make that decision for you. Only you get to make that decision as a parent. Thank you. Maria. Thank you. Um, so I am not in support of in any way banning books. And I want to speak. Um, specifically to racism and sexual orientation and gender identity. In Washington state, we are lucky because we have more expanded civil rights protections than federal law, particularly sexual orientation and gender identity. And we also know that our students who are um, on the LGBTQIA spectrum um, have the, the, some of the worst academic outcomes. If they don't see themselves in their curriculum, they disengage from school. I know that me, I did not experience learning about my culture until I went to college, which is egregious. I can't imagine having a public school system where students don't see themselves reflected in their curriculum, are able to tie connections to their lived experience. And the last thing I will say is, uh, along with Director um, Seidel, we do have a policy that involves parents and educators. Educators are professionals. They go to college to learn how to do curriculum alignment and to align it to our state learning standards and I trust them. Thank you. Okay, the next question we'll start with Frank. Mandatory training now is required on training on diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism required for teachers, staff, and I believe for school board directors. The question is, what is your opinion of the need for the school board directors to participate in such training? 
I think that it is a, the job of the school board directors to facilitate conversations and make sure that those avenues are open so that these conversations can be informed properly um, and with adequate representation for everybody that we're trying to meet here, which is everybody. Um, I think that it's imperative that we open those doors and um, that we engage the community properly. Um, you're probably going to hear a lot from me tonight about community engagement because I, I feel like as elected representatives, we represent our communities um, as unique uh, microcosms of what is valuable to them and what's important to them. And then it is our responsibility to bring those voices to the table. So um, I'm looking forward to that opportunity, and I think that it's imperative that we represent our communities and make sure that um, those doors are open for those conversations to happen properly. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, um, so uh, it's really important to have training um, in DEI. Um, I currently do it in my job all the time. I'm also currently trying to implement the um, inclusion of A for access because everybody has access needs, particularly our students in our K through 12 system and in our college systems. And what is really cool is, is that um, the, um, the newer policies that are coming in play with the um, Citizens Advisory Committee are looking to embrace policy um, 1005, which is the key um, fundamentals of being on the board, and that includes increased training. So we're gonna have to do that anyway. And that is really exciting because that's moving with the involvement of, or the involvement of our students. We're meeting them where they're at, and that is exactly what our school board should be doing because that is to reach student success we have to embrace students for who they are as learners and as people. Well, thanks for the shout out on the policy series, Jess. So that's something Director <laughs> Reed and I have been working on over the spring and the summer. Um, and Jess is right, and it is a requirement for school board service now. Um, and I personally have gotten a lot of value out of participating in those trainings. I've had the chance to do several of the trainings that are offered through the School Directors Association. Um, and I also just got to pilot one of their newest trainings on foundations of cultural proficiency, which I highly recommend for my fellow directors when it becomes available. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that this is contentious for some folks, but I, I just see them, them as tools um, to increase my ability to connect with the students and families that I'm serving. As far as the requirement um, for folks in our buildings, that's the number one thing that I hear about from students when I go around and visit schools. I visit every school in our district every year, and I meet with the PTO organizations and the booster clubs, and what the students tell me is that every year, the adults in the room need to be doing more work to better understand who they are and where they're coming from. And it's not a threat or you're doing a bad job, it's a we can always do better and we need to do it together. Thank you. Um, I really love this topic. So this is something that I have worked on um, at the state level. So the requirement for the School Directors Association to have cultural competency training um, actually came from work that I lead at OSPI. So we put in the requirements through the Educational Opportunity Gap Oversight and Accountability Committee, which is a group, a bipartisan bicameral group of people of color talking about policies to close the opportunity gap for people of color. And the gap that we saw was that school directors were not aware of the civil rights obligations for their students, the requirements that are both in the teacher standard, which is also something I worked at the state level on to have cultural competency training. And it's also a requirement for teacher and principal evaluation. So every end of the spectrum had requirements for uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and civil rights training, except for school board directors. And we are the largest group of electeds in the state of Washington, and we control a lot. So it's absolutely imperative that we have this training because we have to fulfill our civil rights obligations to our students and our staff and our families. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I believe that it's very important to, for school board members to be culturally competent. That, to me, includes more than taking a training, um, reading a book. It means walking the talk. And it means exemplifying what it, is, what it means to include everyone in your decision making and making sure that all of your decisions af impact um, students in the appropriate way. I think that we, as a school board, have struggled with have it, with engaging in conversations appropriately with the community when they have concerns. All all concerns can be are valid, and I think that there's there's some validity to all concerns. It's it's a matter of 
you know, representing, being representatives of the communities we truly serve. We're directors of, di of different districts, but we represent the entire community. And the entire community we serve is very diverse, and we need to be prepared to engage with them. Thank you. Okay, the next question, question number four, we'll start with Jess. The School Efficiency Committee is under the management of a company with a history of closing schools and consolidation. There are schools who are against consolidation and making plans to charter. What do you say to convince those families against creating charter schools? That's a really, um, it's a really hard place to be in, right? We want our kids to be in the places that they know. And we want our families to be able to have that for their children. Um, what I'd say is um, I would want to really look at, help the efficiency uh, committee look at why do we not have that enrollment. And we know that some of it is population, um, that there's a lower population than enrollment. But are there students in the community who are already going to private schools, who are already going um, to charter schools or alternative or home schools, and engaging with those families and saying, why? Why is that happening? What, is, what can we do to engage with you to come back into the school? Because we want K through 12 to be the gold standard, and that starts with creating inclusive practices in those classrooms, and that would help increase the enrollment, which would then increase the funding. Yeah, that's a great question and a really hard question. I think the first thing I would say is that any demographic company 10 years ago was looking at building schools, is this year now looking at consolidating schools? And that's happening across the country. So pinpointing that particular practice with the one company recently it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, every demographics country, company that we talked to was looking at school efficiency studies and not building schools because the birth rate is down in our country. Um, what would I say to folks who would rather start a charter than engage in that efficiency conversation? Um, I think it's really hard to fully fund schools in the current climate. The fact of the matter is, is we used to collect about a third of our revenue from the, the local levy. We no longer collect that money. That used to supplement small schools, increase salaries for staff and special education, and we just can't do that anymore. So what I would say is come to the table and be part of the solution and help us figure out how we can get lots of kids or lots of people around our kids to give them as much support as possible, but don't leave the space without having that conversation. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So one thing that I would also build on what Director Seidel said is that this process, I'm not in favor of closing schools, and I think that we've been through a lot of trauma as a community, um, coming out of the pandemic and just everything that we've been experiencing. That said, we do need to figure out how to allocate our resources within the existing structures that we have. Director Seidel mentioned this about levies, but we don't receive the same amount of state funding that we used to receive. There's been multiple changes in both the way that we're allowed to collect the levy and some of the ways that we are receive compensation. So we already are structurally disadvantaged in the funding that we receive, and we have declining birth rates, and we have, let's talk about the issue of housing affordability in Olympia. It's hard to live here. Um, and so all these factors are kind of a perfect storm, but I do not support closing schools. I do support looking at having neighborhood schools that are equitable for all students. And for charter schools, that's a very complicated process and it takes away from the institution of public education. So I would urge anyone not to consider that um, because you're taking away from public education. Thank you. Tomorrow. Well, I support community organizing on all levels and I, you know, have the utmost respect for parents who are organizing together um, to achieve a goal. Um, my conversations would, I would, I would encourage them to continue to come to the table and, and, and voice your concerns to the school board. But as a school board director, it is my job to hold the superintendent, superintendent accountable for um, his, the role he plays in our financial um, state. And the conversations need to be had about accountability, um, about um, you know, where, where are the, where, why, why do we have discrepancies in numbers? Why are we not, um, you know, why are we in this situation? Getting to the bottom of that and really re, um, build, rebuilding trust with parents. I understand the frustration. Um, I'm not, I don't support school closures, you know, and, and 
if we cannot hold our superintendent accountable for the use of the resources, then we're going to continue to have these problems with our and conversations with the community. Um, I'm not necessarily against charter schools per se, but I, because I'm pro education for our kids um, in the best ways that are going to be able to meet them where they're at. But I am adamantly against closing schools in our, in our system, and I will advocate for these communities as much as I can um, in meeting them and advocating for their needs to make sure that these schools that have become a staple of our communities um, can remain open and do that very thing. Like we, like we heard, like, like we've heard um, several other people say, um, starting a brand new charter school is a hard thing. It's, it's an arduous task. And I think that being part of the public education system will afford them more tools in the long run and in the immediacy to meet the needs of the community. Um, and I, I invite those communities to the table so that we can hear their voices and advocate for their needs as well. So. Yes. <clears throat> Can I just say, I think I, I, I started oh, with sorry. it. I was oh, like, sorry. oh, wait. I was like, get another answer. Okay, thank you. Question five. Um, I'm putting together two questions in my mind here. Um, what is your opinion of um, school resource officers and what qualifications should they have? A related question is, what are your thoughts about the need for armed officers in schools? Is this me first? I think. Yes. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I was ready for that one. Well, first off, this is a really important question. Um, and if you tuned into our four hour meeting, you know that we have wrestled with this and continue to wrestle with this. Um, we've been working, Director Reed and I have been working at, on updating our policies this spring and summer. And we had brought a first reading of a policy about school safety back in July or August and then brought it back for second reading a couple weeks ago. Um, and a lot of what I think about that is was stated very clearly in that meeting. But what I will say is that I believe in a holistic approach to school safety. Um, and that includes a partnership with our public safety organization um, at the city. Um, but that, there are a lot of tools um, in that toolkit. And I think we need to stop thinking about this as a one solution um, issue. Public safety in our schools requires collaboration. It requires wraparound services. It requires crisis intervention. And sometimes it does require response from uniformed officers. But I'm encouraging the superintendent and our policy encourages the superintendent to take a holistic approach to that partnership. Thank you. Um, this is work, again, um, that I feel very passionate about and I've led at the state level. I do not support the traditional model of SROs in our building. And yet, we do have to negotiate our MOU and define our relationship with the police department. I support the concept of the new requirements that passed in the law. So there was two bills that passed, um, 1214 and 1216, and now there's 13 areas of required training, including threat assessment, but also things like bias and cultural competency, civil rights law. These are all requirements for anyone who's in any security position in our schools. Um, there's also the requirement that data is reported for every single incident where there is any sort of security or police um, interaction with students around a discipline thing. And the last thing is that you cannot use school resource officers for minor discipline infractions. I support the idea of us working with our local community and our police department and our city to define the relationship of our schools with the police department, but I do not support a traditional SRO model. Thank you. Tamana. I personally do not support um, SROs being reinstated in our schools at this time. I support our schools, our administrators, continuing the training of our current safety, safety personnel to ensure that they are able to respond adequately to situations that need, that pose a threat to the students. I think that, you know, trauma, and a trauma-informed trauma approach does not include placing armed officers in the school on a regular basis due to the trauma that has been caused by our students and families across this nation um, due to um, police violence. I believe that, you know, again, a relationship with local law enforcement to ensure that they respond adequately and appropriately to situations of threats is, is responsible. Financially, I don't believe that this district is in a position to reinstate officers when we just cut programs, including orchestra. Um, the cost um, associated with reinstating SROs is um, not one that we need to bear right now. 
work? This is a really tricky thing right now, and I think that we've made some progress here. I would, I would say immediately that um, I am pro SRO in our school, and I think that it's. It is, like Hillary said, like this is only one part of the bigger solution. Having SROs in our schools is not going to solve all of our safety concerns immediately. Um, it's, 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 it's not like flicking a magic wand and having everything solved. Um, there, it's a multi -fa it needs to be a multifaceted approach. Um, so it's only one piece, but it is a critical piece um, to providing our staff and our students with a safe environment that they can trust. Um, as far you asked a question about training, I think that uh, it's imperative that all of our SROs, as policy and law dictates, they go through specialized training to know exactly how to meet each of these kids, which is also the biggest piece to not just calling 911 in the event of a situation and getting whoever shows up. These people, these SROs, are specifically trained for this. Yes. Um, I am currently with the way that the SRO model is. Um, I'm not for SO, SROs in schools. However, I do really um, appreciate the amount of dedication that was taken in the um, security policy that created a lot of amendments that was at the school board meeting um, that was four hours long. Um, it really demonstrates a conversation that we are having with law enforcement. Um, but law, SROs do not stop gun violence. SROs do help in other situations in mediating um, custody battles and stuff like that. I do believe in that. However, um, it would have to be if SROs were voted into schools by the school board. I would want continued training, not just the training that they have to receive beforehand. I would want a school board member to track the disciplinary rates that SROs are in those schools. Um, and I want increased continued training for teachers to have knowing the protocol and to take the protocol seriously. That's what's going to keep students safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we'll go back to Maria. Uh, please express how you will uh, gain an understanding of the opinions of the people you represent about key school district decisions and topics. And the, the writer says, thank you for running for these offices. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, w I think continuing to do what I have done during my time on the board. So I have phone calls, emails, meet for coffee, have lunch, meet with everyone who contacts me. But I also have worked on creating some of the policies that we've invested in as the district, like expanding the student representative. So now that we have one student rep from every high school, we are also invested in trying to get a kind of a junior student rep for middle school students so that they can start to learn how the process works and be involved at that um, level. The other thing that I'm hoping that we can work on as a district, and it's kind of part of my platform moving forward, is that we have a really good relationship with our union partners, all of our educators, principals, paraeducators, but we do not have a formal advisory capacity for educators to inform our decisions. So I work with union leadership to learn about their issues and meet with teachers and other staff at schools, but I want to set a formal advisory structure in place for the staff themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will continue doing the work that I'm doing now to communicate with families and individuals who contact us. I try to respond to everybody who sends an email, whether they're upset or whether they want to compliment the district. That doesn't happen very often, but I do engage in conversations and see them through as best as I can. There's always a common ground I think you can get to as long as you can, as long as you're willing to do, to have that dialogue. People don't like to be talked at; they like to be talked to. And one thing the district um, must do better, and that is involve the community in the process before the decisions are being made. Not while the decisions are being made at that voting moment, but prior to that. Our, our listening sessions, our, our community forums, are not adequate. We need to be. Able, we need for folks to be able to talk to us, and we need to be able to respond to them in that moment and hear their concerns and give them real answers you know, to their real life questions. I just think our community engagement has to improve and I'll continue advocating for that. Again, I'm very excited about the opportunity to engage with the communities directly as uh, we work to advocate for them. Um, 
I think that getting in to the communities is imperative as each of, like I said earlier, each of these schools, each of these communities is a little microcosm of itself. And uh, they all have unique needs and they all have uh, unique concerns um, and abilities and values. And I think that it, um, I would love to see board representation more in the communities and, and engaging with them, uh, going to them, and I have that flexibility to be able to do that with working and living so close here in the middle in the heart of all of, that we, all of what we do. I'm looking very much forward to, and I commit to the citizens that we will, that I personally will be going to each of these schools on a regular basis to engage with what they're doing and, and to hear from them and advocate for their needs. <coughs> Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Please express how you will gain an understanding of the opinions of the people you represent about key school district decisions and topics. Yeah, so um, I've been already meeting with a lot of individuals just on my campaign trail um, from all walks of life and from all backgrounds and really soaking in what folks have been telling me. Um, I do think it is really important to be going into the schools. I plan to do that once a month um, and being able to connect with the communities, uh, particularly in the special ed classrooms because I know that that is a really big piece um, that folks are still not receiving enough support in, both um, through staff and through funding. Um, I'm also thinking about um, community engagement and I'm thinking about it in the context of, you know, Olympia is the community itself. So breaking down a lot of the silos that our community experiences and being able to put kids into the community and being able to engage with them that way so that they have more opportunities for success um, as well as connection and just also being able to, I dropped it, Frank, sorry. <laughs> it went out. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Yeah, this is a really important question. We represent not only all of the voters in this community, but also the just shy of 10,000 students now. Um, I think what I plan to do is continue with what I have done since I began serving, which is visit every school every year, typically multiple times. I also meet with all the school support organizations, which are like our PTOs or booster clubs, um, if I can. Um, sometimes our meeting line, meetings don't line up. Um, I'm super excited about the Youth Advisory Board that Director Flores um, mentioned. This is a, a high school group and a middle school group that will serve as in an advisory cap capacity for the board um, and the expanded student reps. We also have an excellent school climate survey that is a really great resource for our, uh, the board directors. And I'm also really involved in our um, external community work through the Regional Planning Council. Um, and also looking at expanding our relationships with our tribal partners and expanding community voice in our policy work through the committee that Director Reed and I are working on. Thank you. Okay, the next question will start with Talana. What would you do to hold the district administration accountable for providing a safe learning and work environment for marginalized students and staff? And the second part is, what would you do to lead decision making that creates this safe environment? That's a long one. Um, what I do, for, I'm just saying for accountability altogether. Um, we collect data and we hear data. We hear the, the the results of the surveys and the data, and there's there isn't action. Um, when we cause harm, we need to be responsible for the harm that we cause, and we need to try to do better. Unless we are um, actively listening to those that we've harmed and you know trying to and, and asking them to assist us with those solutions we're not going to get anywhere um, as far as the administration goes we need as a board I mean we need to we need to engage the community also in the, um, the I can't even think of the when you supervise, when you're getting an evaluation process of our administrators, I think that's an important lens to look through. We don't see everything as school board members, and we don't always get that information. So I think including the community and the staff in the evaluation process of the administrators would help us to hold them accountable. 
Would you be able to repeat the question? <laughs> oh, yeah. Two parts. Yeah. Um, Good luck. <laughs> what would you do to hold a district administration accountable for providing a safe learning and work environment for marginalized students and staff, and how you would lead decision making that creates this environment? Mm. I would like to see the uh, development of some milestones that we could uh, measure our success in this on. Um, I, I think that I think it's imperative that every single one of our kids is met where they're at, um, whether marginalized or not, and ha that their voice is represented at the table. Um, as far as accountability, I think that's where the milestones come in, and we can um, we can. I, I look forward to having the conversations to figure out what that accountability could look like. Uh, I think accountability is a, an imperative piece to that as well, making sure that that is successful. But um, our marginalized. Uh, our kids that exist in the margins need to make, and we need to not forget them. We need to make sure that they are brought alongside everybody else. Jess. Um, I think starting by holding the uh, district administration accountable is ensuring that they're undergoing all the same trainings uh, that we're required to, um, being able to um, look at some of the gaps that either are happening financially or happening within um, our, our schools. Um, and saying why, like why is this and how could it be better, right? Um, not just suddenly for like, okay, this is great, but what, it, what next? And so um, really being able to dig into it, I think one of the great things is, is that we are looking at policies, the policies that are really old, um, and really um, finding them to be more relevant to our students, um, being able to lead decisions, um, being able to I really love the stepping stones, like the milestones, um, but being able to create the inf like the surveys and being able to bring that information back and actually utilizing it and not just having it sit, right? So having it as forms of power that are utilized by our community. Thank you. Yeah, this is a really important question because ultimately the school board is accountable for student learning and student learning can't happen in environments where students don't feel a sense of belonging. Um, I echo what everyone shared about policy. Policy is the school board's promise back to the community. You vote for us and we make a promise to you about how we're going to live into the, the things that we said we would deliver on. Um, and that's also how we hold ourselves accountable. Um, I do support the idea of more of a 360 approach to the superintendent's evaluation. Um, I think that's not just about holding the superintendent accountable, but helping him do the very best work for our families and our kids and our educators. When it comes to monitoring and stepping stones, I would like to draw everyone's attention to our district strategic plan and district improvement plan, which was lovingly co-created with the community back in 2018. And it does include exactly the kinds of monitoring pieces that people are asking for. I invite you to come. I think our outcome six monitoring report, which is about living collaboratively with our global, local, and natural world, is coming up soon. And you can see what some of those milestones are we're working on in the next couple of years. Sorry, I, I'm chuckling at um, Director Seidel and <laughs> doing the plug. Um, so one of the things that we are ultimately responsible is the superintendent's goals and his evaluation. And in my time on the board, we have really focused in both on Superintendent Murphy's communication, but also the way that he holds the district accountable for achieving some of these school improvement milestones. Um, it's a collaborative relationship that the board is in, engages with, where we also set goals with him on what we need to have him improve on with his cabinet team. Um, I think that those can always be strengthened. But the thing I want to bring it back to is let's name who the marginalized groups are. So we have put in place an equity tool. Um, it's at the beginning stages where every time we make a major decision, we ask for disaggregated data by race, poverty, homelessness, disability status, every single part of a uh, student's demographic background to help us see if there's going to be disparate impacts or disproportionate impacts, and for us to tailor our approach to not just ignore those impacts, but to make sure that we reach every student. So that's one of the things that I've worked on, and we're continuing to build that work with our equity policy and plan. Thank you. Okay, the next question will start with Frank. What do you think is included in socio-emotional learning and how should it be addressed in school curricula? So I think at the heart of, uh, of our SEL curriculum is um, the need for each of our kids to feel like they are, like they're, 
like they're represented, like they're welcome. Um, and I think that, I think that it's looking for my notes here. Sorry. Um, I think that typically the people who know those students best are the parents. Uh, and the approach that my wife and I have taken in the past is uh, we've engaged us like a partnership to make sure that uh, we know what's going on in the schools so that our kids can be best supported at home and so that the schools and our teachers and the educators and the staff know what's going on at home so that the kids can be best supported at school as well because a holistic approach benefits the students every single time. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that that's imperative. That kind of partnership uh, is what's core to making sure that our students have a healthy emotional well-being at schools. Thank you. Jess? So social and emotional uh, learning really focuses on our students being able to name what they are experiencing within that moment so that they're able to self-regulate their bodies, which then in turn allows them to utilize their learning mechanisms in their brain, right? Working memory, executive functioning, all of those pieces go into social and emotional learning. So that also really ties into how our students are able to connect with each other as well as their teachers and as well as what they're going to be able to do when they go out of the K through 12 system. So how are they going to be able to communicate with an employer? How are they going to be able to be successful um, at their jobs and within a college setting or in their uh, uh, apprenticeships? So social and emotional learning is really at the core of what makes our students who they are both as human beings but who they are as seekers and learners and really propels them into success way beyond what just happened in the K through 12 setting. Thank you. Hillary. Yeah, this is a, a, another great question. Um, listen, uh, social emotional learning is about developing skills for students that align to the state standards. There are state standards for social emotional learning and the work of a school district is to make sure that they uh, approve a curriculum um, that aligns to the state standards and that's what we do in the Olympia School District. So our work is really to teach social emotional learning the same as we do any other set of learning standards and to empower our educators to tailor their lessons to the experiences, identities, and needs of the students in their classroom the same as they do with anything else. We need culturally responsive social emotional learning the same as we need culturally responsive instruction in any other discipline area and um, I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing um, in that area. I think we also need to make sure that we have adequate staffing for students when they're dealing with tricky social emotional stuff and that's why we've increased social workers and behavior support folks and restorative practices staffs at all levels of our schools. Thank you. Um, so this is something also I'm so passionate about all these things. Um, I staffed the social emotional work group at OSPI that created the social emotional learning standards for the state. And those standards are based on, on an organization called CASEL. And those standards include things like self and social efficacy. So knowing what you need as a student to be, uh, um, to have efficacy and then how to be socially have efficacy. Self and social awareness. It's basic things that we need, like um, Jess said, to be able to get to executive function. The social emotional learning standards are not some standalone thing. They are embedded in everything that we teach, whether it's math or science, it's instructional. Anyone who's been a teacher will tell you that you can't teach a lesson until you're able to get the students to be able to know how to regulate, how to express their needs, how to ask for help, how to partner in groups. So social emotional learning is part of instruction, it's embedded instructions, and it's part of universal design for learning, which is a concept that comes from the disability community, but it, it applies to everyone, which enables, it's enabling conditions to allow every student to be successful in the instruction. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> yes. What do you think is included in socio-emotional learning and how should it be addressed in school curriculum? What I think is included. I think that um, harm reduction in all its forms should is included in that in social emotional learning. I think that trauma informed practices, culturally responsive practices, and um, you know, resource, you know, having, have, make, ensuring that the, our teachers have the, the resources they need to meet those uh, learning needs for, of all of our students. You know, something that I, that I haven't heard a lot about um, since serving on the board is reaching out to our teachers and asking them what they need. How are they, you know, what do they need um, to balance themselves as educators? 
um, they have a very tough job to do. And I think that as they're pouring into our students, we need to pour into them to make sure that they are um, in a position to teach our, teach our students and, and, and do the great job that they do. But I think that the sewing into them is, is, is what is missing, even though that was a part of the question. But I think that that's what um, we need to focus on more. Thank you. The next question will start with Jess. <clears throat> what do you think are the main challenges facing the school board, and how do you propose addressing them? Um, I think uh, is the underpayment of paraprofessional staff um, is definitely one of them. I think, uh, you know, being able to work with having a really strong working relationship with the Washington Education Association, ensuring that we're working um, with the union to ensure that COLA is being, um, being um, you know, raised along, you know, that they're getting paid to meet COLA, but also when thinking about like just the complete loss of staff. Um, so looking at the way um, we are giving out RIFs, so that goes out, uh, they need to be out by May 15th. So being able to get that to the legislator much sooner so then um, the legislator could potentially give more money in order to ensure that those, um, that, those uh, that they can put the RIF line down um, later, so, or earlier I mean, so that that way um, folks know that they're going to have, having to be replaced, moved or distributed. Oh, Mia. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are two things that I would say are the most pressing issues for us right now. The first is the budget. We did not solve our budget woes last spring. We have um, a continuously declining income from the state. And the legislature has been really clear with us that they do not intend to help us solve that problem. And so we have some hard decisions to make in our community. But I think we're a innovative community. I think we, uh, we have an incredible group of folks who have gathered to do the school efficiency review. And I think that's part of the solution. I also think part of the solution is we need to get ourselves up at the legislature advocating for full funding for special education. Right now, our local levy uh, supplements about seven to eight million dollars worth of special education and it shouldn't be that's basic education the other issue that I think is facing us is still recovery from the pandemic students have gaps in their learning and we need to be laser focused on making sure that the first and most important duty of the school board is to educate our students and make sure they're achieving academic success thank you um, so I'll speak a little bit adding on to the funding I'm not sure if everyone in our community is truly understanding what we're saying when we get less from the state. So we receive, as Director Seidel said, less than special education funding. There's an arbitrary cap of 13.5% of students with disabilities that a district can have for the state to pay it. That's arbitrary. That's based on a study that was done in the 1960s. We have about 18% students with disabilities. They have a right to a education. It's a free public education, and we are paying for it out of our local levy money, which is unconscionable. So this is one of our funding issues. It's also compensation and regionalization. We get less for each teacher than we used to before the McCleary decision, because we have very tenured teachers, and we do not get a regionalization factor that adds additional funding for high cost areas. Coincidentally, Yelm got regionalization and you can ask yourself where is it cheaper to live Yelm or Olympia I did think Yelm is probably cheaper and Olympia is more expensive but they got the funding the two other big things are of course academic recovery but the one I want to say before I end is mental health our students are in a mental health crisis and we've built a ton of supports to be able to surround them with supports thank you can you repeat the question <coughs> yes what do you think are the main challenges facing is that was that the list? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. What do you think are the main challenges facing the school board and how do you propose addressing them? Um, I'm going to answer that a little bit differently. I think that um, regaining the trust of the public. Um, I think that we, the school board has lost the trust of the public. Um, we've had, there have had to be some, there have been some tough decisions that had to have been made around the budget um, regarding all types of issues. And I think that regaining that trust by by being transparent and, um, you know, again, having conversations with the public and not us talking at the public. Um, a lot of what Maria said probably doesn't mean a whole lot to people. The region, you know, we need to speak to the public in a way that they understand us and they know what we're talking about. 
Um, yes, we need to advocate at the legislature, but what are we advocating for if we're not being good stewards over the resources to begin with? We need to, um, we need to reassure the public that we are gonna be um, stewards over, over those resources, and we need to, um, to overcome the challenges. We need to do our job. We need to have uh, oversight over the budget. We need to review and, and revise and write policies that are relevant, and we need to um, supervise our superintendent. Thank you. This one's really tough to get into 60 seconds, but um, yes, I, I agree. The pandemic has changed the world and we were not immune to the impacts of that. Um, coming back from that has been hard. We've seen um, several main challenges. One, uh, the budget. I think I would like to see us uh, seek partnerships with community organizations uh, that specialize in some of the things that we need. From Pizza Clatch to DSHS, like we need to engage community organizations that specialize in what our students need in the schools. Um, and like Maria said, uh, we, need to, we need to figure out this, bud, this funding thing from, from on high because uh, it is not, it isn't, it, they're absolutely right, it is not, um, is not adequate how we're being funded right now. Um, our academic proficiency scores have taken a huge hit. That's another one. I think we need to focus back on academics, which will attract families back to the district, which will then help with the budget because the money follows the students. And division is one of the biggest things that we're facing right now. Like Tolana said, more community engagement to regain that trust is imperative there. Thank you. The next question, we'll start with Hillary. Special education funding is critical, but has been jeopardized recently in budget talks. What would you do to ensure the needs of our special education students to continue to be met? Yeah, well first I want to start by assuring everyone that we are meeting the needs of our special education students. Students who qualify for IEPs are having their IEPs staffed and funded. The challenge is that we have to use money that's supposed to be for like optional things to do that and that means that we don't have those resources to fund additional salaries and fund smaller schools. I think the most important thing for folks to know about what's happening in special edu education in our district is that we have a laser focus on inclusionary practices that started last year and is continuing this year. The only um, instructional coaches we have retained um, in the budget cuts are the instructional coaches who are specifically assigned to support special education teachers and classrooms. And that's where we need to focus a lot of our, our work in terms of special education services. And I do think we need to advocate at the legislature. That's something that President Huffman and I have been working on. We have a group of 25 or so committed advocates who are going to show up again this session and keep telling our story. Thank you. Thank you. I would um, begin where Director Seidel ended. I have served as our legislative representative um, for the board multiple sessions and then on the legislative committee. And that advocacy piece starts with all of us in the room. Um, when we put a face to the student with a disability and are able to say, you know, this is what this impact is having, this cap is arbitrary, it changes the conversation. So I've worked with the board and the community on getting folks to testify in the legislature on the impact with special education declines and funding. We get money from the legislature called Safety Net, and that money is for really extreme disabilities that require like a one-on-one -on -one paraeducator. We've been really successful in getting the funding, but it's a grant. And to rely on that is um, scary because every year we have to apply and every year we have to wait to see if we receive it. So the sustainability of special ed funding, I wish we wouldn't call it special ed because special ed is basic education and those students are general education students first. They happen to have a disability and they're entitled to the exact same education as everyone else. Um, and I do support legislative advocacy. I testify a lot at the legislature. I think that in order to ensure the needs of our special education students are met. We, if we want the support of the public and we want, um, we, we do need to advocate for our, for our students. I think a lot of people were surprised when the, budget ha when the budget came out. They didn't see things coming. And I think if we did a better job at preparing the budget, the public, um, letting them know where our shortfalls are prior to, again, this, you know, you know, the first reading of the budget or whatever the process is, you know, folks will, are be, will, better, will be better prepared to help us advocate in the community. Um, I think that, you know, continuing to monitor the, the data and, and, and trusting that the, our, our staff are um, 
doing what they're supposed to, to to get that information to us so that we can make informed decisions is important too. But I think we are, we have a staff in that program that do very well. Right. Um, so I touched on this a little bit. I, I we've heard great things. I think advocating at the legislature level is imperative here. There are um, arbitrary caps like we've heard uh, from several people on the board. We, there are arbitrary caps right now on the funding towards special ed needs as if we're as if we're, we're only allowed to have so many needs. Like it's, it doesn't make sense to do something like that, um, especially when those were established so long ago and they don't seem to be valid anymore. Um, uh, like I said, I would like to see uh, some investigation into where we can engage local organizations to help free up some of that money, uh, because like Hillary said, this is basic education for, for, our, special, for our special ed students. Um, local organizations that can, specific, that can meet specific needs where our teachers can't be as effective in some of these regards. Um, I would also see, like to see long term, I would like to see, I would like us to look into what kinds of things are being mandated by the government where they aren't backing up their mandates with the funds to support those mandates. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, I'll just do a quick plug. I also agree with being able to, um, you know, put a little bit more pressure on legislature and just reminding constituents to go out and to advocate and as, to support our teachers and being able to do that as well. Um, one of the uh, things that I'm really thinking about as a person with a disability and who went through this is we're more than just learning about education. Uh, a lot of us aren't given the opportunity to learn how to develop relationships, how to do financial wellness, how to manage, um, how to cook food, those types of things. And I do I absolutely agree with Rake. I, you know, I think helping students get more involved in the independent living centers or bringing the independent living center staff to the schools or getting those students out into the community to learn more. Um, and the way that we can do that is to uh, connect with the cultural access program who does have funding for field trips for public ed transportation so that can happen, but also just teaching disability history week. Washington State can do that and we don't do that. By the way, it's October, folks. <laughs> Okay, this is the last question before we get to closing statements. We'll start with Maria. The question reads, what is your understanding of the relationship between the school board and the superintendent? Uh, we hire and fire the superintendent. That is one of our primary responsibilities. We do his or her or they, um, their, their evaluation. We set goals for the superintendent based on data on their performance, but also data in the district. So for example, when we started working through um, some of his evaluations through the pandemic, we put a really keen focus on community engagement, um, trying to strengthen some of the community outreach that the administrative um, part of the district did. We put in the requirement that he uses the equity analysis um, tool that I mentioned earlier, where we look at every single decision through an equity lens and actually look at the data. Um, those are some of the things that we have the power to do with the superintendent. Also, he is, or she, or they, um, is our colleague. They are the secretary of the board. So they work with us on the board to work with both administration and with staff, and then we have this quasi-judicial role where we also hear appeals and complaints about the district with the superintendent. Thank you. Laura. <clears throat> the role of the, the relationship between the school board and the superintendent is we are, we supervise him and we are supposed to be holding him accountable. Um, I think that what, since, since becoming a part of the board, I've heard from many members of the public that some of the questions that I've asked are ones that have never been asked of the superintendent. We should be ensuring that we, he provides us the information related to what he's presenting to us. We, have, we must ask questions. We, we, just because somebody tells us something doesn't mean we just believe it. Um, we need to question discrepancies and we need to, you know, all, sh you know, look for areas of opportunity and look for, and, and the things that he is doing well. Um, I think that as a board, we need to ensure that he's communicating effectively and intentionally with the public and not, and responding adequately to um, concerns brought before, before him and his um, cabinet. Thank you. Frank. Um, 
So I think at the basic level, like they've said, uh, hiring and firing the superintendent is the role of the board, um, setting goals and establishing milestones for the superintendent um, and measurable progress checks throughout. I know that you guys do that a lot. Um, I think that um, it's imperative that we look at the relationship as a partnership with the superintendent in certain ways as well, where uh, we need to work together to engage the community effectively and appropriately. And, um, and I think in a successful relationship with that, it, it, we can also be a resource to the superintendent for, uh, for what they need to develop more skills or to engage things better or whatever that be. Okay, Jess. Uh, well, what's really great about um, being able to work with the superintendent when folks are on a board is that the superintendent does bring a lot of knowledge to the forefront and also brings recommendations um, and really being able to try and work together in order to meet those goals and standards for the schools. Um, the school board also does, like they've mentioned, um, work with the hiring and evaluating of the superintendent. Um, and also, the um, I would also view it also as helping that person grow, grow in their duties, but also grow in their um, involvement with community engagement, and more than just in the meetings. But like, how do you actually connect with the community in, an, in a um, non-superintendent way? Um, somebody once told me that they, um, their superintendent did soup with the superintendent. I thought that, that was a really cool idea. Um, but also the superintendent acts as a buffer. So when school board members get information from constituents or from community members that is potentially harmful or isn't the right avenue, they, keep, uh, they <coughs> can be directed to where it goes. So, so Thank it's you. a really nice partnership. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's already been said. Um, I would expand a little bit on what Jess said about um, helping and supporting the superintendent. Listen. Um, it's a rough game out there if you are trying to hire a superintendent right now. And um, I am really invested in making sure that our superintendent is doing the very best work for our community as possible. And anyone who's ever been a manager knows that it's, it's part accountability, but it's also really about coaching and helping that person live into their best self. So I think that's a huge part of the role of the board um, with, with relationship to the superintendent. And sometimes I think it can be exasperating for a superintendent to have five bosses. But but I also like the idea that you have five brains to pick when you have a question or something you have to, 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 to sort of tease out. Um, I think we do have a role to play in the hiring and the, the supervising and the accountability piece. And certainly that should be done in collaboration with the community. But ultimately, I really believe our jo job is to work collaboratively and to coach the superintendent to their very, very best work on behalf of the community. Thank you. <clears throat> now we'll have the closing statements. And I have one to read from our, uh, from Leslie, who could not be here. Talana, would you, you start, right? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone who came to this amazing forum. I was not, I'm very surprised that so many people are here, and I'm glad. Um, I appreciate um, the League of Women Voters and the library and um, TC Media for hosting this event. I want to say that just vote, <laughs> whoever you vote for. I mean, at the end of the day, representation does matter. I feel like the work that needs to be done in this um, school district to, um, in the area of equity and inclusion has to, can, can be done with a, a, a diverse group of voices. And I bring that diversity. A lot of the decisions that I make, I'm impacted by them. Or the, and the community that I work hands on with, the, com the individuals in the community that I work hands on with, they're impacted by those decisions. So, I, so I'm very thoughtful and I, try, and I really try to put that at the forefront of my decision making. I think that if we all get up and vote, we will get good candidates. I have nothing bad to say about anybody up here because we're all running for something and believe passionately about, passionately about serving students. So just get out and vote. Amen. Uh, again, like Talana said, thank you so much for hosting. Thank you uh, for putting all of this on and thank you everybody for participating. That's huge to show up and that's uh, incredible. So the, I'm running for Olympia School Board uh, position number two and I'm running because as we look forward, I want to see a focus on the excellence in education that the Olympia School District has come to be known for. I want to make sure that our diverse makeup of school staff and students can all feel welcome in a welcome and safe environment. 
Um, and I really look forward to the opportunity to engage directly and authentically with each of our unique communities uh, that make up our school district. Like I said, I have an extensive history of community engagement um, and uh, I'm a project manager by trade. And I think that more community engagement is how I am committing to you to do this job well. So uh, vote for Frank DeRocher on November 7th. It's coming quick. Thank you. All right, Jess. Um, I'm going for Olympia School Board District 2. Um, and in addition to my educational um, experience work-wise, um, I have also helped reach new folks in um, uh, technical careers as well as apprenticeships. So I do value those just as much as I do value education. And I think that students deserve those opportunities. Um, I also really, I'm an advocate at heart. That is my wheelhouse. Um, and I'm just thinking about, you know, we have a great 90% um, graduation rate well, what about the other 10%? And also, what about the students who went to gravity? What, what happened to their story? Because their story didn't just end. They still have a story, and now they have a different beginning. So how do we continue to uplift the voices of our students that aren't really heard? And I think we do it directly by engaging with the students. We give them opportunities to keep voicing, to create surveys, and to let them to understand who they are. Um, and I had the first week of classes, for students at Evergreen, it really is about understanding basic needs as well. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for caring so much about what's happening in our school buildings. That is the most important gig um, around. The city council members do not know what they're missing. Um, I, would, I would ask for you to look at the work we've done over the last six years. We've invested heavily in social emotional support, social workers, behavior supports. We've almost doubled the amount of art, music, and PE, our elementary school students we've in received. We've increased seats in advanced learning and alternative learning. We've invested in equity through a native program staff manager and um, someone to coordinate mentoring and work with our BIPOC students. And we've also invested in uh, almost $800,000, a little over $800,000 in our high poverty schools. Um, and those have returned benefits to us. We have emerged from the pandemic still the highest performing district in our county with one of the highest graduation rates in the state. It's not 100%, and our goal in our district improvement plan is 100%. So I encourage you to stay on this journey with me and give me your vote in November. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo everyone's comments. Being on the board has been the honor of my life, and I don't just say that you know, to gain votes. It has been the honor of my life. Um, I mentioned how I started my career as an educator. I started in education because I saw the power of public education, and I've mentioned that it's changed my life. And I chose this path for my career, both as an educator and a policy leader, and now as a board director, because I know what our schools are capable of, and they are the most sacred and transformational places in our community. Everyone touches a school in some way. Everything that I've done on the board has been to empower students to have their voice at the table, to make sure that their needs are being met across the continuum of their needs, to build wraparound supports for them, to have authentic, meaningful family and community engagement, and to let educators lead. Um, I am the only teacher on the board right now, and that lens of having been in the classroom just influences everything I do. So thank you for the honor of electing me to the board previously, and I hope I continue to gain your support. Thank you. <clears throat> Since she was unable to attend, Leslie Van Liesout provided a statement regarding her candidacy. Here it is. My name is Leslie Van Liesout, and my entire professional career has centered around supporting students, educators, and our great school community. I'm a public school graduate, and I'm proud all my children and grandchildren attended Olympia's incredible public schools. As a teacher and an educational administrator, I put my values of transparency and accountability towards stakeholders into action. We need modern, data-driven solutions from evidence-based research. This means supporting educators, making hard choices, and updating our practices for a modern world. Our schools are facing an incredible and unprecedented challenge. Enrollment is down, creating financial instability. A homeless crisis continues to expand, creating disenfranchised and marginalized students. And the mental health emergency for young people means we cannot afford to use the same old solutions and expect different results. 
Olympia School District must face the changing future of education. In my experience in education as a parent, grandparent, teacher, and administrator, my work in local and national arts, and my commitment to the social needs of families makes me, Leslie Van Leeshout, the candidate to bring a calm focus to the Olympia School District. Please vote. So thank you to Jess Tortola Colombo, Frank DeRocher, Talana Reed, Marina Flores, Leslie Van Leeshout, and Hilary Seidel for running and participating in this forum. We especially thank our partner, TC Media, for producing and airing this forum. And we are indebted to TC Media for years uh, of making these forums happen and educating voters. Very important. And we thank the Olympia Timberland Library for helping plan and providing a venue for this forum. Uh, and thanks also to those in the League of Women Voters who were here tonight uh, doing silent work. Would all of you that I mentioned either stand or raise your hands, and wave them out, so we could give all, all of those volunteers from the media, the library, and the league. Thank you. Thank you. We encourage our viewers to be a voter in the upcoming election on November 7th. Every vote counts. Ballots will be mailed out by the 18th of October, and you may register to vote up to Election Day. And thank you for watching. <laughs>